If you will, I'd like for you to turn to John chapter 1. And a couple of things that we see in John chapter 1 that um, we're going to be talking a little bit about today in John chapter 12. Um, first of all, in verse 9, it says, There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came into his own, and those who were uh, his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave to be the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but as the will of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we saw his glory, the glory and only the begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him, crying out, saying, This was he whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Now, I want you to kind of remember some of, the, um, some of the things that we've been talking about and some of the things they want to stone Jesus for was because he said, before Abraham was, I am. And we have another testimony of John saying, before, he, before uh, I was, he, he uh, existed. We also see something else about uh, Jesus. He's called the Word, and he's also called the Light. Um, something else that, um, we, that I did want to, to, to notice is that if you turn on down to John chapter 1 and verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael saw him, How do you know me? Jesus said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And then Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Now I want you to remember these couple of things that John kind of starts with about him being the light, the word, and then also uh, this uh, statement by Nathaniel that he is the king of Israel uh, as we move into John chapter 12. However, we still have not finished John chapter 11. Um, what happens in John chapter 11? Anybody remember? Hopefully you do. A pretty big chapter. Lazarus is raised, Lazarus is raised from the dead. Yeah, Lazarus was raised from the dead. And so if Lazarus was raised from the dead, there's, a lot of, there's going to be a lot of uh, talk uh, about this, uh, a lot of excitement about it. And as I said before, you know, as he makes that statement, um, uh, Jesus, whenever he's telling um, Martha, you know, hey, listen, you're going to see great things, and you, all you have to do is believe, and she starts to talk about her belief, and then we see exactly what, uh, what happens. We uh, see also in verse 43, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And whenever uh, the man who had died came forth, bound hand, hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped uh, around with a cloth, Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. And so we talked a little bit about if you had a scene in your head about what would be happening here, probably a lot of astonishment, a lot of... Um, Tears of joy, um, you know, just a, 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 a festive scene is what I would kind of picture, uh, an excited scene. And um, so we kind of start fading out of black into a different scene now. Because now the Jews, and specifically the Pharisees, have now heard of this. In verse 47 it says, Therefore the chief priests and Pharisees convened the council. So you got this shouting and this excitement and it kind of fades to black and now we kind of open back up and now we start to see a different scene and there's this council uh, that's talking about all the excitement and everything else let's see what they have to say therefore the chief priests and the pharisees convened a council and they were saying to each other what are we doing for this man is performing many signs now that seems like an honest question. And it seems like a pretty good observation as well. If they were asking the right question for the right reason, they would be asking, why are we standing opposed to this? Because look at all the, the signs that this man is doing. But that is not their intention and why they ask. Their intention is made in the very next statement. If we let him go on like this, 
all men will believe him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So you see their intention. Ask the right question, what are we doing? This guy is performing all kinds of signs. But the reason they ask is to provoke themselves to stop this, not to believe exactly what we saw um, Nathaniel say. Their fear of the Romans coming in, taking both their place and their nation away. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people that the whole nation not perish. Now he makes this statement, and there's a reason that he makes this statement. It's because he was the high priest and because he actually prophesied. This was actually a prophecy that he made. Now, what is the wisdom in what he says? Christ had to die for the sins of mankind, and so that Israel would have their Messiah, and they could believe in him. Yeah, you know, and the thing that Christ has been trying to get people out of is don't think of it in worldly terms, think of it in spiritual terms. But what, you know, their statement about the Romans coming and taking our nation. And then his statement is, where is his mind? But yet he prophesies, and it's a foreshadowing what's to come for the nation of Israel and for the, all, all mankind. And so we see that, um, we see that uh, basically said that in verse 51. He did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one children of God who are scattered abroad. Now, I wanted you to remember in John chapter 1, what did it talk about the, um, why Christ came? He came so that we could have the right to become the children of God. And so as John kind of starts this, we start to see him keep coming back to these types of messages that he's the light, he's the word, he's the, the reason that he even came here was so that we could become the children of God. And yet we see this being stated by the high priest here. We also see in verse 53, so from that day on they plan together to kill him. They've got to get this stopped. And again, their fear is that the Romans are going to come down and destroy everyone and take away their place. Mike, I don't know if you talked about this last week, but that's exactly what the Romans did 37 years later in the most terrible, horrible way you can imagine. These, this exact thing happens. They, they come and take, take everything with them. And the majority of these people probably would have been alive still to, to see that happen. Yeah, they probably would have and um, to, to see that come true. Um, you know, but you know this this whole prophecy, and we also see from that time forward, they are really looking for Jesus and looking to kill him. And so it gives a reason as to why Jesus starts to kind of pull away from the public eye again. In verse 54, it says, "Therefore, or because of all of this, therefore Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly amongst the Jews, but went from here, uh, from but went away from there to the country." near the wilderness into a city called Ephraim where he had stayed with the disciples. And so he's kind of withdrawing himself from the public eye, um, first of all because uh, they're wanting to kill him. Now, is it out of fear that he does this? Not his time yet. Just not his time. And we're going to see that very shortly. And um, we also see this triumphant entry into Jerusalem as well. Verse 55, Now the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up to Jerusalem out of the country <clears throat> before the Passover to purify themselves. So they were seeking for Jesus and were saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think? Do you think he'll come at the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had already given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he was to report it so that they might seize him. So they've already been given their marching orders. And so there's a lot of buzz kind of going, along, going around about this man, Jesus. And he's basically an outlaw now. And we're gonna, we've got to get him. He's a fugitive. And so we need to capture him. You need to tell us and just report it if you do see him. So a lot of people are like, have you seen him? Do you think he'll even show up? 
So we'll see in verse uh, chapter 12 and verse 1. Anything kind of closing that that chapter we need to bring up? Go ahead, Clint. I think it should strike us back up here, you know, when they talk about the Romans taking away their place and their nation, is that whenever someone can get a position of power or influence or stature in some authority type level, it can go to your head. And it clearly went to their heads. And it's that group think mentality as well, where they didn't want to probably break the mold of the group. And so they all become lumped into this council type situation, and they're all lost. Yeah. They're all taken away by their proud situation. Well, they get each other kind of worked up in a lather, and then, you know, the, the problem that comes with that is you have people who actually do believe that Jesus is the Christ but are scared to say anything about it. And we'll see that a little later on in John chapter 12 as well. But you're right. You know, it's hard to give up a position that you have and kind of step down off of that. And really, they weren't expected to step down off of anything, but they were expected to do their, their role, and that is to be the spiritual leaders that God intended them for, for them to be. And they weren't. They had turned it into something else. It was more of a bureaucracy than, than anything. Anything else? Therefore, six days before the Passover came to. Uh, came, uh, <laughs> therefore, Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table. Mary took a pound of very costly perfume, a pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Anybody know what this is? This perfume? It's spikenard. I, I looked it up, so don't feel bad. It's spikenard. And um, it's a very costly perfume. As a matter of fact, the, what she has here probably would have been about a year's worth of an average labor, laborer's uh, wages. So uh, very, very costly. Very hard to make, very, you know, but it had a very good aroma. And um, so we see that she does this. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, so a very uh, strong perfume and one that permeates the air. And we also see in verse 4, but Judas Iscariot's got a problem with that. One of his disciples who was intending to betray him said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to pilfer what was put into it. So, a couple of problems with Judas Iscariot here. What seems to be his main problem? Greed. Greed. The love of money. And we see later on, Peter write about that, that the love of money is what? The root of all evil. It's the root of all evil. And this is some, an observation that one of the disciples had, and that is John writing this for us. You know that there had to be others that kind of knew what the issue here was. And so, you know, just in the experience that they have with just Judas Iscariot, it would have been a true statement that, that he makes. But we also see something else, is that his idea of, um, you know, why was this done this way? You're supposed to take these things and give to the poor. Well, we see what Jesus' answer is going to be, and that is, therefore Jesus said, leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Now, how many times up to this point have we really kind of seen him talk about there's going to come a time that all this is going to end? It's not the first time he's brought it up. We've seen him uh, talk about uh, it, right now it's uh, day. You can do the work during the day, but soon the night's coming. We've seen that a few times. We've seen other times where he says that uh, basically plainly he's going to die and um, raise up this temple. You know, we've, I'll raise up this temple in three days. They didn't really know what he was talking about. So many times they've been kind of uh, given the opportunity to understand that he is leaving and that he won't be around. And so when he makes this statement, he basically says the same thing. Any questions or comments about what happened? Go ahead. 
Uh, what Mary did here was completely under her own authority. She had the right to use that year's worth of wages as she saw fit. She did it in a way that honored the Lord, anointing him for the burial. And if you just take Judas or anyone else as a critic, they have no right to say anything. Right. It's none of their business what she's doing with it. Could she have done other things? Yes. But this is what she chose to do. So it goes over to the principle in Acts 5. When it's ours, it's under our control. And nobody has a right to tell us what it is that we're going to do with that. And um, we have to be careful about that because sometimes we maybe second guess how people use their resources that God has given to them. And here's a very good example of where she, she did what she believed was right and good. And it was right. And that's a very good point. And one, you know, that I don't want to skip over either. I mean, you know, a lot of times we think we've got it figured out and that other people need to do exactly what we do in order to, to honor God. And obviously that's not the case here. Um, and as you pointed out, Jesus said she's done the right thing by this. Anything else? Go ahead, Nancy. Well, it, it appeared to me that Mary recognized him as the Son of God. Judas did not. Yeah. Yeah, very good. You know, especially after the experience with Lazarus, I mean, her brother sitting right there next to Jesus and was in a tomb not too long ago. And that miracle, we're about to read more about it here very shortly, and, you know, she does recognize that fact. Very good. Go ahead, look, John. You can also see an attitude. Judas almost has an attitude like the Pharisees because he looks at this kind of, this is sort of along the lines of what Stephen pointed out, but... Judas didn't get anything out of what she did. He's like, that was a waste. Why did you do that? And we can be the same way sometimes. We see what somebody's doing. They're like, why are they doing that that way? Or I didn't get anything out of that sermon. That, or that, that song leader wasn't any good. Or why doesn't he pray a better? Well, don't, don't look at what we get out of everything. It's not about us. It's about service to the Lord. Whether we're participating in it, someone else is doing it. We don't always have to look at it from our viewpoint. Put your put yourself in someone else's shoes. Think about them. Encourage them. It doesn't always have to be about us as individuals. It's, it's about other folks also doing what they can to serve the Lord. But Judas has a very selfish attitude in, in the way he's viewing what she is. Yeah, you know, I had as, a, as an older note that I'd had in here, I guess at one time I'd read through this, I'd had the question that had, did Judas not see the feeding of the 5,000? And, you know, his concern was, let's take this money. And, well, Jesus already said, you don't need, need money. I mean, you, God will provide that for his people. Go ahead. Well, to that point, he, John makes note that Jews didn't ask him because he cared about the poor. Right. He, he just wanted to be able to pull some of that out for his own good. So he's, he's really deceptive here in his complaint. Right. Well, what he's looking at is what he can get out of this situation. Right. And that's what we fall into. What can I get out? I didn't get out of anything that I that I in, in the the uh, I didn't get anything out of the service today. Well, that's it, it, it's not what I get out. It's what I put in. Right. And that's that. Judas is you know dishonest, but he's completely missing the point of serving serving Christ. Very good. Anything else? Yeah. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, I. She, she says, "Is it come and demise." I don't think so. Yeah. I think that I, no, I don't think so. I think she was just doing something to honor him, specifically because of what he had done for her brother, and she was um, she was saying with this, "This man is worth a year's worth of pay, uh, wages." I mean, so I, I believe that's what it was. Thank you. I, I didn't. Now, Jesus kind of ties it in with his eventual death. She has come to anoint me um, and that she may keep the day of my burial. But I don't know if they knew that when that was going to happen. And Jesus sells out the Lord for less money than what that perfume is. Yeah. yeah, a lot less. All right, let's move on. 
Verse 9. The large crowd of Jews, then the large crowd of Jews, then learned that he was there. So they find out that he's in Bethany. So they go down there and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. So now it's turned into a couple of different things here, and that is they want to talk to Jesus, but they also want to talk to the proof. And, you know, what Lazarus, you know, what's it like crossing over? You know, I don't know what they're asking, but obviously, you know, um, he's going to share with them, you know, something spectacular. And there's a lot of other people, we'll find out later, that a lot of the people who were there with Lazarus are spreading the word also. Now, notice verse 10. But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. Now, we know the story of Lazarus and the rich man that Jesus tells in Luke chapter uh, 16. Now, what he says and Abraham tells the rich man is what about people coming back from the dead? They won't listen. Even if one comes back from the dead, still they won't listen. But they have what? Prophets and prophets. They have the prophets and Moses that they can listen to. Now, is this not exactly a, a case of that? And that is, they have one that comes back from the dead, and still they do not believe. Notice what we talked about in John chapter 11. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. And so we cannot allow that to happen. And so we've got to put to death not only him, but also any kind of evidence that any of this was worthy of being called the Messiah. Go ahead. I really don't know how they thought that Rome was going to invade them if, you know, if everybody started believing in Jesus. I mean, obviously they would lose their positions. But I don't mean not necessarily the Roman government would have seen that as a threat at that point. You know? I, I don't know. I think it's irrational fear, and I think it's a very, it's a very short-sighted fear I think also. the Roman government was steered that way. Jesus was claiming to be king. I mean, that's one of the things in the trial. And that's essentially what they laid on Pilate, like you got to do something about this. So I think they're looking at it from a man's perspective. They're looking at it from a political angle that, hey, he, he gets too popular. It's going to grab the attention of the Romans. They've had many conflicts with the Romans in times past. They're looking at it that way. They're not putting faith in God. They're not looking at Moses and the prophets. They're not looking at the evidence and saying, this is what God wants. Right. God brought our people across the Red Sea, destroyed Pharaoh. They're not thinking about that at all. They're thinking purely carnally as men in his plan set a while ago, protecting their power base. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. I think it was about their power base because even Pilate, when he asked him, are you a king? He said, not of this world. And he obviously did not consider right. that a threat to the Roman government. And he was a co-consul at the time. He, would have been. Yeah, he, was, he was willing to let him go. Exactly. He was, he was the one to go there at the time. Yeah. All right. So we do see that they are trying to kill Lazarus. They're going to try to kill the evidence. They're going to try to kill everything that they can about this man, Jesus. <clears throat> Verse 12 says, On the next day, the large crowd who had come to, uh, to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Now, from this point on, there is a lot of cross-referencing that we can do. Um, I've got a few cross-references, and you may have some where you've studied John before because there is a lot kind of going on here, and not only just in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament that um, John kind of references to um, whenever, he, whenever he's writing this. But what we see is this. Uh, if you will, in verse uh, 13, let's turn to Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9.
After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So we see this idea of these palm branches uh, coming uh, again in Revelation. John, same writer, uh, writes about these palm branches that he sees uh, in this vision that he has in Revelation. We also, if you will, go ahead and turn to um, Psalm chapter 18, Psalm 118. Verses 25 and 26. And again, remember what they're saying. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray. Give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. And so that's referencing back to uh, Psalm 189 and a couple of others that, uh, that you can find uh, as well. In John chapter 1 and verse 49, the reason I, I pointed out Nathaniel in his statement, his statement was what about Christ? John 1 verse 49. King of Israel. You are the King of Israel. So John started with this mindset uh, in John chapter 1. Nathaniel's statement kind of shows where John's kind of leading to this. And now we have this large group that is saying exactly that. You, it says, he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And so we see that now more people have accepted him as the King of Israel. And who the prophets and Moses have been pointing to. And we're not done yet. Because there's more. And what it says is, Jesus finded a young donkey sat on it as it is written. And in that verse, it is cited from Zechariah chapter 9, and verse 9, which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud. And picture the, the scene that's happening. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous, and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so we see that just as we talked about with let them see Moses and the prophets, they have them. Even if one come back from the dead, they would not believe. They have Moses and the prophets. And here we see all of this continually to take place. These are not signs or miracles that he's doing, but it is prophecies coming about. Prophecies that they should have known about. Any questions or comments? Okay. Go ahead. Great rulers of the church didn't recognize. I'm sorry. What? The, the Pharisees and Sadducees. Yeah, the religious rulers of the time should have known this, and they and they didn't. No, they Correct. Didn't. We also see that uh, in verse 16, these things. Now notice this. Now his disciples has been with him. These things the disciples did not understand at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of Him and that they had done these things to Him. And so, much later on, we see that they're being remembered, saw this, you know, the whole complete puzzle picture is coming together for them. But something I thought was significant about, first of all, about this young donkey that it talks about. First of all, they're stubborn as they are. But to have a very young one and to, it, for it to be able to ride it shows great, um, great power over nature. Because these things are usually wild. They're not going to stand still and let you ride them. Have you ever seen a, a wild horse? I mean, they have, you know, people make money trying to break those things. Go ahead, Joe. I'm not so sure that. Um the well, you know, like, I think Solomon, I don't know if it was a meal or a donkey, Solomon was, was placed on one of those when he became king, when he was announced king. He was, but it wasn't a young one. Right, no, I'm just saying that it, it could be also a sign of Jesus' loyalty. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's what they're saying, is that he's coming, but it specifically says a foal. 
And, you know, and that in Zechariah, whenever it um, says that in Zechariah, it was not talking about any kind of earthly king coming uh, on, and it just says a donkey. It says it's a foal, so a very young one, one that probably was not broken and tamed yet. At least that's what I understand. All right, let's move on. Um, all right, these things they didn't understand, verse 17, so the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify him. So they're out in the crowd and they're talking about, I was there and, you know, and all the excitement that was happening there with that. And it also says, for this reason, also the people went and met him because they had heard he performed this sign. So the Pharisees, who were already worked up, what do they say? They say to one another, you see that you're not doing any good. Look, the world is going after him. They are losing their minds. What are we going to do? Now we see something in verse 20 also. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. Now we could point back to where some of the uh, Gentiles were allowed to come to some of the feasts. Um, and I believe you know, some of that's being played out here. But what we see is this. Then these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida, a Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip came to, and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now remember what we said whenever he was kind of hiding out? And now he's kind of come back in and there's Hosanna and you know all this crowd and all this kind of stuff stuff. And so when we see that, we see Jesus' um, statement here is that the hour has come. It's re it's ready. And then he makes this statement to them. Looking back, we know the story, so we can kind of look back at this and we understand what Jesus is saying. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and it dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. And so what we see here is Jesus talking about what? His death, his burial, resurrection, the fruit thereof. And the only way that Christ can make new one man, you have the Jews and the Gentiles. Remember we talked about this in Ephesians chapter 2. But we have the Jews and the Gentiles and we have to bring about a new fruit. So Christ falls to the ground, He dies, and out pops this fruit. And that is, I believe, what He's saying here is that those two groups, because we're just talking about the Greeks coming up and wanting to talk to Him, and those two groups now coming together. Anybody agree, disagree, talk about? Give you a little time to think about it. He says in verse 26, if any man serves me, let him follow me. Yeah, and. I mean, I think he's trying to say any. You may go to Gentile. Correct. And we also see. Um, whenever we were talking about there in, in John 1, that he's talking about the, the light of the world. Everyone. And anyone can come to God now. And we see that, um, that being played out in here also. Go ahead. In 25 in particular, he's, he's trying to sober their thinking. These, these Greeks, and I'm sure there are many others that had a curiosity about Jesus. So these men are like, they come up to one of the disciples, hey, we want to see you, kind of thing. And the Lord's sending this message back, look, if you love your life, you're going to lose it. Un understand what I'm about. If, if you're going to come after me, if you hate your life in this world, you'll keep it for eternal life. So where are your priorities? Right. And this this is not something you take lightly. He's talked about it in counting the costs. He's talked about it to the rich young ruler. Like you you really need to know what you're saying here and who you're committing to. Right. 
Yeah, uh, Jesus isn't just some kind of sideshow, so to speak. Right. This is something much more serious about the um, about the relationship with mankind to God. Go ahead. Well, is this also a reference back to 52 in the previous chapter where Caiaphas is actually speaking, but not of himself. He has been he's been given this to say. And he says right there that it's not for one nation only, that but that it brings all men, all scattered together. Yeah. To and, go but he doesn't understand what he's saying there. But right. And you know, and, and some of the things that I think that what we'll see is from here on out, some of the teachings that start to happen and some of the things that are being discussed is more in line with mankind rather than just the Israelites uh, for the rest of John. All right, in verse 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Um, in this, um, we see that the, in, whenever he says the Father will honor him, <coughs> excuse me, in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30, you don't have to turn there, I'll read it for you. Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, promise that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. And now the Lord declares, far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And so he's referencing back to that. There are a couple of other references that he's making whenever he makes that statement. Uh, sometimes we think that these are unique statements that Christ is making, but actually he's pointing towards the prophets and uh, Moses and everything that had been written beforehand of him. And again, the reason for that is because of what John chapter 1 says, that this is the Word come to life. He, start, he uh, continues on. Now my soul has become troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Now that is a very hard statement for us to kind of understand because we're trying to wrap our heads around what our own purpose is. Whenever he says his, troll, his soul has become troubled, but yet what's he going to say? Is he, is he supposed to tell the Father, take me out of this situation? Because this is the very purpose that he came for. So he can't say, Father, take me out of this, because that's not going to happen. This is the very reason that he came. And so that verse 27, there's a lot of power into that. I think that we... I know that I overlook sometimes, and what am I supposed to do here? I mean, this is my purpose. This is what I came for. I'm, we're, going, we're, we're doing this. Go ahead, Paul. In this verse, I think we could see 100% man and 100% glory of God. Yeah. And what you'll see in the very next verse is he says, for, but for this purpose I came to this hour, Father, glorify your name. In other words, he's laying himself down for what reason? For the glory of the Father and that his name is glorified. And we also see that there's an answer that comes. Then a voice came out of heaven, I have both glorified it and I am going to glorify it again. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it, they were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said to them, This voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon the world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. In verse 32, uh, this is referenced again. Uh, in uh, basically the same way, if you will, turn to John chapter 2. I'm sorry. John chapter 3 and verse 14. Backwards there. John 3 and verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And so we see him uh, making that statement here. Um, we also see 
um, in John chapter 18 and verse 32, whenever they, whenever Pilate makes this statement, and I'm in John chapter 18, I'm starting in verse 31. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Now, if they were to put him to death, what would have to happen? What type of death would he have died? He would have been stoned. And in verse 32 it says, This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So he couldn't die, at, he didn't die at the hands of the Jews or else he'd been stoned. Instead, it was something that was going to be lifted up. And we see that statement here in, um, in John chapter 12, in which he's saying this is how he will die in verse 33. He was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he would die, that is, he's going to be lifted up. So Jesus himself even foretelling the future. Verse 34, Then the crowd answered him, We have heard out of the law that the Christ must remain forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So they're a little confused by what he's saying here. Because they understand kind of what he's saying is that he's going to have to be lifted up. But he's supposed to live forever. Now, there's a lot of referencing to this in the Old Testament that they are referring to, to their understanding. But again, very short-sighted in the fact of only what they can see in front of them, the tangible, having a hard time making the spiritual connection here. Go ahead, Joe. The only way you could have survived if you did not bit by the snakes back then would have been to have looked at that snake. Mm -hmm. To have looked at it. So it was the only way to be saved. Yeah. In a physical sense. And I think that's... He's taken it from the spirit. Right? Yeah, and they have to show a tremendous amount of faith also just to look upon the snake, and you know, so we'll see that as well. But you know, it continues to say that. All right, let's move on. Um, verse 35, Jesus says to them, he answers, for a little while longer, the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may come, become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke, and he went away and hid himself from them. And so, again, another reference to John chapter 1, where it talks about Jesus being the light, being the word, all of those things that we continue to see. And you can see that John, whenever he's writing this, continues to reference as to who Christ is. And this teaching that, that Christ does supports exactly what John said in John chapter 1. Anything else? Oh, we're going to move on. We won't make it to the end, but we're going to make a valiant effort. Verse 37, But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him, now this, and that is their unbelief, was to fulfill the word of Isaiah, the prophet, which spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. Where does that come from? 51.1. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 1. Isaiah 53 and verse 1. We, we know that. And um, one of the reasons we know Isaiah chapter 53 is because as it continues on, um, and we see in Acts chapter 8 where the eunuch is actually reading there in Isaiah chapter 53. And so Isaiah 53 is very familiar with us, but it was a prophecy, and here this prophecy was actually being fulfilled live time as we read it there. For this reason they could not believe, for Isaiah again said, He has blinded their eyes, he and, and he has hardened their heart so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal him. Anybody have a cross reference where that's from? 6.10. Yeah, Isaiah 6.10. Um, we also see that um, the main thing I wanted to kind of take out of this was that they, it says, even with all of these signs being performed where they could see them, and that's important because 
the reason this book was written so that you may believe. They were there, they saw them, and they still didn't believe. So it's a very hard jump for mankind to be able to acknowledge that this is the Christ, this is the light, this is the, the Word come to life. This is, as we've pointed out before, God in the flesh. So as we move on, we see in verse 41, these things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. Nevertheless, many of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Let's stop and talk about that just a little bit. Um, when he makes that statement there in verse uh, 42, what does it say about the leaders? They desire praise and honor from the flock. <laughs> okay. But if you fall out of favor with them, they're tied and offered. Well, that may have been part of it, but specifically of what he's saying here, Paul, is that um, many, even of the rulers, believe Christ. They believe that He was the Christ. But because of fear, they would not confess Him. So you've got a couple of different things going on here. Does it take more than just a mental ascension? Yes, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's not enough. That's not enough. And we see that you know they um, they believed in him, but they loved what the approval of men rather than the approval of God. So let's talk about this terminology of love. Is love just an emotion? It's an action. It is an action, and they showed what they loved by an inaction by not confessing Him. And so, we also see that belief and love go hand in hand whenever we're talking about Jesus uh, and, and His followers. Is that if you say you love Me, you got to do My commandments. You can't be a closet Christian. I mean, you have to you know, stand for what is right. Go ahead, John. The demons came in my night. And he was interested in he was, and it ain't the last time we'll talk about Nicodemus either. Certainly interesting. Yeah. What we see here is the is the idea of what John has been trying to hit home with us about what true belief is. Belief is not just a mental ascension. I I, I make some kind. Of, it, it is an action that you have to take. It is a it is a an active faith that saves you. It is not just a belief. And so as we kind of read that, and we read how many times John has mentioned the word belief in here, and now it's actually being defined for us that many of the rulers believed in him, but they wouldn't confess him. And the reason for that was because they loved the praise of men, or the approval of men, rather than the approval of God. Even with all of these signs and these wonders and all the teaching that's going on, still they refused to confess him. And so we see that this, and that is just making a mental ascension, is no better than disbelief. They are no closer to him. If anything, they're further away. Any question or comment? Got a couple. Go ahead, Clint. I'll get you to To your point of they're getting further away, sin compounds sin. And so, you know, they want to get rid of Jesus. Well, now they want to get rid of Lazarus, too. They, they want to kill him. Right? It's the same thing that David did. I, I committed adultery, now I need to kill the, the husband. Judas. I'm greedy, I want the money. Then he realizes what he's done, I gotta kill myself. Right. It, sin compounds sin, it's a pattern throughout the Bible, you can see it in the lives of these people here today. It should be a good warning for us that when we let the little things in. Yeah, our red flags need to be going off all yeah. over the place, yeah. Very good. Because it's gonna snowball into something that we cannot manage anymore. Correct. Stephen. The, the being put out of the synagogue was no small consequence. Right. It would affect them religiously, socially, economically. So it's not like we can 
read this and say, well, they just, you know, only thing that was going to happen to them was their bunch of stodgy old Jewish rulers who would sneer at them. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about their life would be upended right. if they were put out of the synagogue. So it tells us, you know, the, the, the level or the extent to which we need to be willing to go for the Lord. Our life may be completely wrecked from the standpoint of, you know, friends, family, job, all these other things that give us, quote, stability in life, but there's something greater. Right. And, you know, and, and really what, what Christ is doing is He's bringing a lot of instability in, as you pointed out, just in their, in their lives, but bringing stability into eternal life. And, you know, again, trying to make that leap into spiritual thinking is very hard for the Jews. It's very hard, it's hard for us as well. And uh, I, I appreciate what you're saying, uh, uh, both of you, in the fact that you can kind of see the pattern in which a little bit of sin does. And also, whenever you're um, faced with the truth and you have to deal with the truth, what it can cost you. Go ahead, John. I'll let you have the last word. Isaiah was told to preach to the people and to keep preaching and to keep preaching. And as he did that, their hearts got harder and harder and harder. So you can see the effect of the Word of God on a hard heart. It's the same thing that Moses did, that God had Moses do with Pharaoh. He kept having the plagues and the miracles and just made Pharaoh's heart harder and harder. And that's exactly what's happening here with Christ. He's doing the miracles. He's doing the signs. People have dishonest hearts, so their hearts get harder and harder and harder. And that's the opposite of somebody who has an honest and soft heart who will, as you said, confess. They'll repent and they'll believe. So Christ here is sifting the wheat and separating the wheat from the chaff here by, by, by doing these miracles. And it's the, the, their hard hearts are, are calling them out. Yeah, and more than more than once, we see that people are judged by the words in which he says, not by any kind of action that he does, or because he's got a gavel or anything like that. He speaks something; it is absolute truth. Either you're honest or you're dishonest at that point, and so you have the decision to make, and you are the one that causes that judgment to happen. All right, if there's nothing else. I'll go ahead and close that class.